Hello and welcome back to our study of Paul's epistles to the Corinthians. We are entering into our study on the second canonical letter to Corinth. So let's go ahead and jump right into our text today. Uh, we won't do a lot of hemming and hawing and beating around the bush. We're going to start in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and we're going to cover the first 14 verses this week. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy our brother, to the church of God that is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in the whole of Achaia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction, with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort, too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him you, we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer, so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. For our boast is this, the testimony of our conscience, that we behaved in the world with simplicity and godly sincerity, not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God, and supremely so toward you. For we're not writing to you anything other than what you have re what you read and understand, and I hope that you will fully understand, just as you did partially understand us, that on the day of our Lord Jesus, you will boast in us as we will boast of you. So before we jump into the study, uh, we need to just set a little bit of backdrop for, uh, well, from 1 Corinthians. Of course, we remember the general tenor of that first letter and the topics that Paul discussed. It, Corinth was a mess of a church. Um, their members had not sufficiently given themselves over to Christ. They didn't, you know, to, to quote from other places, they hadn't uh, taken every thought captive to Christ. They were too enamored with worldly thinking. Right? They had worldly standards of power, worldly standards of influence. They measured their success in those worldly terms, um, including what they thought was spiritual success. They, they considered themselves to be spiritual people, as we saw. In fact, there was a um, you know, big chunk of Paul's writing to them had to do with the exercise of spiritual gifts because they considered themselves to be preeminently spiritual people. Right, and that, that description of them as, as spiritual goes even back to the beginning of the letter, uh, that they think of themselves in that way. But they're thinking about spirituality in a worldly way. Now, we're going to see that worldly kind of thinking persist in what Paul has to say in 2 Corinthians. This is still a problem for Corinth. Um, Except here, the, the focus is narrowed quite a bit. So Paul talks about a lot of topics in 1 Corinthians where the brethren in Corinth um, have been led astray by worldly thinking. Uh, and each topic is dealt with relatively briefly. Um, the longer ones are, you know, meat consecrated to idols, that takes three chapters. Spiritual gifts takes three chapters. Uh, the resurrection is a long chapter. Um, but everything else is a relatively short discussion, you know, a, a normal length chapter or maybe half a chapter. Second Corinthians deals with fewer problems, fewer topics, uh, but Paul is going to deal with them far more broadly. So Second Corinthians is almost as long as First Corinthians, even though we're going to see fewer topics engage with there. The main thing that Paul is going to engage with is uh, what Corinth thinks about 
Paul's apostolic authority. Uh, you might remember in 1 Corinthians that this was a topic of discussion. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 9, Paul talks about why he doesn't accept any kind of payment from the church in Corinth. That specific topic is going to come up again in 2 Corinthians, uh, but I want us to root this in our understanding of 1 Corinthians. It's part of his broader argument about meat consecrated to idols. Right, so it's, a, it's an example, it's an analogy that he uses. He's arguing against Corinth's rights-based ethics. Right? They think that anything that you have a right to do, basically you should be able to do. And so they've made this argument that, hey, you know, these, these idols don't exist, they're not real, and so I'm not actually worshiping this idol whenever I go and partake in this meat consecrated to an idol. And Paul, remember, proves that they're wrong in really in both ways. First off, they are engaged in idolatry. Right? They're wrong just on the merits of the question. But even if they were right about that, uh, they are, by what they're doing, they're violating uh, people's consciences, particularly those of, uh, you know, their, pa you know, well, no, formerly pagan brothers, um, you know, recent converts who are still not solid in the faith. They see somebody going into an idol's temple and they think, oh, it actually is okay for us to worship idols. And their conscience is defiled. Uh, and the same goes for their pagan neighbors, um, you know, who remain pagan in the city um, that, you know, if they, they think, oh, this Christian doesn't have any kind of scruples about their worship, right? They're fine worshiping our gods just like we are. Um, and Paul says, look, that, that attitude is wrong, right? Even if it were true that you're not engaged in idolatry, you still shouldn't eat that meat if it's going to violate someone's conscience. Just because you have a quote-unquote right to eat that meat doesn't mean that you should eat that meat. Um, and he, as an example, to demonstrate how this works and to show that he's he practices what he preaches, uh, Paul says that he has a right to receive support for his apostolic work, for his preaching in particular, but that he doesn't take any kind of support. Um, in fact, let's pick up in the middle of that argument that he makes. We're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 15 through 19, um, where he explains why he refuses any kind of payment. But I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any such provision. For I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. For if I preach the gospel... That gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel, for if I do this of my own will, I have a reward, but not of my own will. If, sorry, but if not of my own will, I'm still entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my reward? That in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a slave to all, that I might win more of them. All right, and there the ESV translates uh, servant, uh, where what Paul's talking about is a slave, all right? That's the contrast between slave and free. His, as far as his rights go, he's free to collect a living, to collect support, a wage, um, but he has made himself a slave for the sake of the gospel in Corinth. Paul refuses payment so that it will not be an obstacle to the gospel in Corinth. Now, why would accepting payment become an obstacle to the gospel in Corinth? It's because of the Roman culture of patronage, and this is something that's going to come up a lot in 2 Corinthians. Um, if someone becomes your patron, under the, you know, the Roman way of doing things, you're obliged to that person. And this wasn't just the, the Roman way, uh, by the way. This is something that carried forward um, into a lot of European culture. Um, that's why a lot of you know, medieval and Renaissance literature, for example, has an inscription you know, given out to, you know, it, it works are dedicated to the artist's patron. Um, something is very, very common. Um, and in fact, still 
common in some places. Um, but under the Roman system, right, you become obliged to your patron. There's this social expectation that you are supposed to publicly say nice things about your patron. You're to do things that are to your patron's advantage. You're supposed to produce things that interest your patron. Um, you Basically, you are, I don't know, obliged is really the best word for it. Um, there's this huge social pressure for you to allow your patron to exercise all kinds of control over the things that you produce. Um, and it's ultimately meant to, it's, it's entirely transactional, right? The patron is giving you money and expects something out of it. Um, it's not some free artistic enterprise right? where you're basically just given the money as a grant with no strings attached to produce whatever you want. Um, no, there are strings attached. The brethren in Corinth were still big into that kind of culture. Right? We're talking about people who still use the law courts against each other. We're talking about people who attended sacred feasts and idols' temples. Um, people who show favoritism even in their practice of the Lord's Supper. These are exactly the kind of people to leverage the privileges of patronage. Right? And as we talked about earlier in our series, when we were in 1 Corinthians, we know that at least some of the brethren there in, uh, in Corinth were very wealthy. Um, so these are the sorts of people who, again, would have been into the patronage system, uh, and would have used it. I, again, they don't, they typically don't violate social expectations, at least Roman social expectations in Corinth. And so Paul doesn't accept their pay, uh, their support, because that support would turn out to be patronage. It would be an obstacle to the gospel. Um, and it's, it's the kind of thing, it almost, it almost turns into a lose-lose proposition for Paul, as we're, as we will see, because here's the rub. In Roman culture, all serious orators have patrons, right? This is the mark of legitimacy, and Paul has stood up against Corinth's expectations for how a, an important speaker ought to act, right? It's just a... It, propriety in um, in Roman thinking, right? If you are going to be a good serious speaker, a serious artist, serious writer, anybody who's responsible for producing any kind of creative work, you have a patron who supports your work. Again, it's, it's a typical kind of networking thing. This is still the kind of thing that we're interested in in modern culture today, um, you know, making the right kinds of connections um, securing funding for your projects, things like that. Um, those kinds of expectations don't die away quickly in individual people, right? You have somebody who is used to that kind of high-speed, you know, networking type of life uh, that's, you know, somebody who's used to a life where the greed, you know, where the skids are greased with, uh, with money and influence, it's really hard for people to step away from that as they enter into the faith. You can see it a lot even among brethren today. Um, there, there are some brethren who have a hard time uh, divorcing themselves from that worldly culture, uh, even in their practice of the faith. And it was certainly true in Corinth. Uh, we'll find over the course of 2 Corinthians that those expectations are still alive and well in Corinth. And in the intervening time, between the time that Paul wrote 1 Corinthians and the time that he writes 2 Corinthians, the church in Corinth has begun listening to other speakers who do follow these social protocols. In fact, we're going to find there's quite a bit has happened in the intervening time. There's not a whole lot of time that passes between 1st and 2nd Corinthians, best we can tell. Uh, maybe something like a year and a half um, or two years uh, from what I have read. But over that period of time, as we will see, Corinth has started listening to other people who do 
accept patronage and who do show these Roman marks of legitimacy for their speaking. Um, and we're going to see some other things happened as well. There was a there was some episode, some event that took place um, where Corinth dishonored Paul, um, possibly through Timothy. They, they possibly did something to Timothy um, to dishonor Paul. Uh, something bad happened between them. We're not given any details, just that something did happen in the intervening time. Um, and there was quite a bit of, of drama around that. Um, you'll see that, that that controls a lot of the tone of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians is a very heartfelt letter. Um, but returning back to our subject, Corinth has started listening to these other people. Um, and these other people have apparently tried to pass themselves off as apostles. Because we're going to see later on, Paul is Paul sarcastically is going to refer to these men as super apostles, um, since they so closely match Corinth's false expectations for what a, an apostle of Christ should look like. But Paul also calls them out for what they are, false apostles disguised as apostles of Christ. God, uh, Paul considered them to be peddlers of God's word. Um, they were their, their preaching was so perverted by worldly thinking that the Jesus that they preached was a different Jesus. Um, the spirit that they preached was a different spirit. The gospel they preached was a different gospel. Here's where 2 Corinthians is very pertinent for us today, because we're right in the thick of that. Um, people who There are lots of people who claim to be speaking for the Lord, speaking about the Lord, who are presenting a worldly image of the Lord. And it's very enticing. All right? We're not just talking about denominationalism. A lot of this preaching does come out of denominational circles, um, but it, it tickles a lot of ears in our circles. Um, and it's something we have to really, really be careful for. Um, returning to these men who had been speaking in Corinth, uh, these guys for their part, accused Paul of having a weak presence, of uh, you know, not being impressive. I mean, they, they recognized what would have been deficient in Paul uh, from a Roman perspective, and they just brought that out explicitly to the people in Corinth. They, Look at this guy. Has no connections. He's a little puny 90 pound beta male you know this guy it, to put it into modern terms all right this guy's a cuck this guy he's a he's a rhino he's a squish he's i mean there's all kinds of dumb names that we come up with today for for people that we don't think are sufficiently all that this is the kind of abuse that paul would have suffered at the hands of these so-called super apostles um, in corinth and these kinds of guys, again, they're, what they're doing is engaging in manipulation. And Paul ultimately says, look, these super apostles are enslaving you. Uh, they are taking you away from Christ. So one of the first things that we see Paul focus on right out of the gate in this letter is his qualification as an apostle. Now, in one way or another, most of 2 Corinthians is a defense of Paul's apostolic ministry. That is one of the major topics that Paul focuses on in this letter. Um, and that focus begins from the very opening address of the letter. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Now look, practically all of Paul's letters begin in this way. But most of the time it's just a greeting that he really doesn't spend any time focusing on. It's just, it's customary. Uh, but in our text today, Paul expands on that greeting. That expansion, though, comes at the end. In fact, uh, the last paragraph that we've read in our text today really begins to launch us into the next section of the letter, uh, the first major argument of the letter. Um, but before Paul begins that defense, before he expands on what he means by apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, He's going to lay the grounds 
for explaining his apostleship. And he lays that groundwork for explaining his apostleship in the next part of his introduction. And it's another standard element to pretty much any ancient letter, um, but it carries more importance in 2 Corinthians than it might seem. It's a phrase that we hear all the time in Paul's letters. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul opens every single one of his letters with the phrase grace and peace. Every one of them. You can go look. So what's so special about it here? The fact that it becomes immediately the focus, or one of the focuses of the letter. Um, in fact, go back to chapter 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to read verses 3 through 7 again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken. For we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. So here, Paul explains God's nature and lays out the general pattern of the gospel, and it's focused around this grace and peace that he has been talking about. God is the father of mercies. That is, not only is he merciful himself, but he is the creator and source of all mercy. He's the pattern for mercy. Any kind of mercy that we receive, even if it's not coming directly from him, say it comes from some somebody else or some other source, it is ultimately coming from him and patterned around him. Right? And any mercy that we can give to others is ultimately patterned around him. In that sense, he is the father of mercies. He is likewise the God of all comfort. He is the source and pattern for any kind of consolation or encouragement or help. And we shouldn't miss here, by the way, that Paul uses the same language that our Lord used whenever he was promising to send a, a comforter, uh, a helper, what we it's sometimes called a paraclete. Um, if you go back to John chapters 14 through 16, and we're, we're not going to do a, a broad overview of this up on the screen, um, but in those chapters, uh, remember, after he has, he's met with his disciples in the upper room, he's washed their feet, and he gives them his last teaching before he prays uh, over them in John 17, and then goes to the garden and is betrayed. Um, we get this final message in John 14 through 16, and a big part of that message is his promise that the Father is going to send the Holy Spirit, um, whom Jesus refers to often as the Helper in the ESV. The King James translates it the Comforter, uh, because it's this same Greek word family that Paul is using to describe God as the God of all comfort. The same words being used to describe the Holy Spirit and the work of God, um, both in John and in 2 Corinthians. God sends his consolation, his help, his encouragement, his comfort through the Spirit. Now, Paul is going to return to this theme again and again in this letter. Um, it, is, it is a major, major theme in 2 Corinthians. Um, in, in fact, th that's really the purpose of today's reading, is to lay out the, um, really the themes and the, the topics that he's going to be covering. So he's going to be talking about his apostolic ministry, but he is going to talk about it a lot through the lens of the comfort that's provided by God. Now, notice how this comfort plays out we receive comfort from God in our affliction, 
that we may thereby comfort others as they are afflicted. All right, so this isn't just a two-way street. Well, it's not, it's not just a one-way street, right, where we suffer and God sends us comfort. Um, it's not just a two-way street where God sends us comfort and we do something in return for him. It's something that involves us with God and with other people. Right, that pattern of sharing affliction and sharing comfort is bound up in Christ. We share in Christ's suffering, therefore we all share in his comfort. That sharing extends among members of the church. Again, it's not just some, um, some private interaction that we have between us and Christ. Um, we share comfort as we also share suffering. Uh, the the writer N.T. Wright calls this the pattern of interchange. Right? This idea that um, that we receive comfort in our afflictions, and that that's an experience that we share together, and that that sharing is bound up in Christ. Um, just a short name for that entire process. Uh, Wright calls it the pattern of interchange. This this idea drives practically every relationship in the church. In fact, I think we can safely say it does drive literally every relationship in the church. And it is ultimately the basis for Paul's apostleship, for true apostolicity. So it's going to be a major, major theme in the letter, since Paul spends a lot of the letter defending his apostleship. Um, now, he's about to begin doing that explicitly, again, at the end of today's reading, but first, he gives us an example of how this pattern of interchange works in his apostolic ministry. Um, if we go to the next passage in our reading today, excuse me, we'll pick up in chapter 1, verse 8. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction that we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer, so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. Paul ties the pattern of interchange to another key fact of the gospel, the resurrection. In Paul's ministry, he was opposed violently. We read several examples of this in the book of Acts. Uh, and he suffered great abuse, such great abuse that he even fell into despair. And I want you to think about this for a second. The Apostle Paul, of all people, fell into despair. And remember what despair means. We're not just talking about depression. We're not just saying, oh, if Paul's not saying, oh, I was kind of down for a while. Despair means hopelessness. It means you really think everything's over, All right? We're talking about the worst possible, um, the worst possible feeling that you can consider is despair, All right? That's, uh, we're not saying that Paul considered this, but it is the kind of thing that drives people to suicide. Paul thought that he was as good as dead. Again, we're not saying that he was considering suicide. But in his mind, he was as good as dead. And we might remember some of the events from this time period as they're recorded in the book of Acts. All right, Paul had written 1 Corinthians from Ephesus. He speaks there of you know, fighting wild beasts in Ephesus um, in 1 Corinthians 15. We remember this riot that started in Ephesus on account of Paul's ministry. That was just one episode out of a long ministry at Ephesus. If you read what Luke records there, Paul's in Ephesus for a long time. Um, he's writing, first, you know, he writes 1 Corinthians from there. We know that uh, as he travels around, because um, he talks about traveling in, in both of these letters, 
Uh, we know he continually returns to Ephesus. It's kind of his home base for a while. Um, because, as Paul said at the end of 1 Corinthians, there's been a wide door for effective ministry in, uh, open to him in Ephesus. But note, remember what he also says, adversaries are many in Ephesus. Now, again, we remember that riot. And we remember, you know, Luke tells us that it ultimately was cleared up, but you remember what the riot was about. Do you really think that those guys got over Paul causing their whole industry to tank? You really think they forgot that and just let it slide and never bothered Paul about it again? Do you think the death threats ever stopped? Do you think Paul ever felt safe in Ephesus all that time that he was there? All right, it's almost certain that Paul was under constant threat, that he was hounded in Ephesus. Again, he says he fought wild beasts there, and he's describing people. And Paul considered himself to be done for. Right? We were as good as dead. We considered ourselves to be dead, he says. But Paul tells us that God had a purpose in this, because Paul needed to learn how to depend on God rather than on himself. Also, consider that for a minute. This letter makes Paul very, very much more relatable to us, I think. Um, sometimes we think, of, we think of all of the heroes of the faith as somehow being you know, really different from us and elevated in status from us, when really they're just men like us. They're people. Uh, they experience a lot of the same, a lot of the same passions, a lot of the same fears, and fall into a lot of the same traps. And yes, even Paul fell into traps. And one of the traps that he tells us in this passage that he fell into was depending on himself. And the whole purpose of this suffering was for God to show him to stop depending on himself and instead to depend wholly on God. And when we say wholly on God, when we say entirely on God, well, it's bound up in the way that Paul describes God. To depend not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. So when Paul despaired of his own life, continuing in his own hands, God stepped in and showed that it was in his hands, after all, not in Paul's hands. Paul's life belonged to God. The source of that deliverance, the source of that hope, was in God's very nature. He is the God who raises the dead, and so the comfort that we share in Christ flows from his resurrection. Now, Paul spent a lot of time talking about the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15. He's going to spend even more time talking about the resurrection in 2 Corinthians. The, the fact of the resurrection, the fact of the risen Christ and that we will be raised from the dead, it's, it permeates everything in 2 Corinthians. It's the center of everything. The way that Paul presents it in 1 Corinthians 15, that is the, that's the heart of the gospel message, is the resurrection. And so Paul introduces it here at the beginning of the letter as he begins to defend his apostolic ministry in Corinth. All right, so that we've, we've laid all of this groundwork for describing Paul's apostolic ministry. Now let us read again the final paragraph in today's text and see how Paul finally describes his apostolic ministry as he prepares to launch into a total defense of that ministry. We'll go to chapter 1, verse 12. For our boast is this, the testimony of our conscience, that we behaved in the world with simplicity and godly sincerity, not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God, and supremely so toward you. For we're not writing to you anything other than what you read and understand, and I hope you will fully understand, just as you did partially understand us, that on the day of our Lord Jesus, you will boast of us as we will boast of you. Paul's legitimacy as an apostle is that his ministry is steeped in the gospel principles that we've been talking about today, uh, in this, this pattern of interchange 
in the hope of the resurrection. Now, Paul is a legitimate apostle because he presented the gospel in a way that matches the spirit of the gospel. And it's important for us to recognize this. It's not enough for our presentation of the gospel to match the propositions of the gospel. Right? We, we tend to focus a lot on that in our circles. Are we preaching the right doctrine? Right? And that's I think that's super important for us to focus on because there are so many uh, who I think don't focus is uh, as ardently as they ought to on doctrine. Um, but it's not a, you know that focus on doctrine by itself is not enough. Our presentation of the gospel must also match the spirit of the gospel. Paul's simplicity and godly sincerity in presenting the gospel to Corinth prove that he is a legitimate apostle. It's not just the stuff that he said, but it's how he said it, how he presented it, how he's been relating to Corinth, and how he has been showing Christ to Corinth through his behavior and not just through his words. Now, as we're going to see, these so-called super-apostles who are opposing Paul and talking him down, trying to basically secure a, uh, a position and some money for themselves. They were instead steeped in worldly wisdom, precisely what we saw the Corinthians buying into when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians to them. They are presenting themselves, again, with all these worldly marks of legitimacy, letters of recommendation, signs of power, um, and Paul doesn't go in for that. Instead, what, what makes his ministry authentic and legitimate is his faithfulness in persuading Corinth, his effectiveness in bringing the people in Corinth to the Christian faith. I think it's not just the propositions of the faith, it's, it's the behavior and the mindset of the faith. And Paul's the only one that's preaching that. The super apostles are not preaching that. The super apostles are not calling Corinth back to the pattern of the cross, to the attitude of the cross. What the super apostles, we, we'll see as we study through the letter, what the super apostles are calling Corinth to is just baptized Romanism. All right, baptized worldliness. We see that all over the place. In, in the broader you know, evangelical world, in the broader Christian world, especially in evangelicalism nowadays. We've seen it. It's, it's grown so much worse over the last four or five years. Um, the gospel, just again, being Christianized worldliness. Um, and this is a trap that we can't let ourselves fall into. Paul demonstrated this simplicity and this godly sincerity through his sufferings. That's why he brings all of this up. This is all tied together. The suffering that Paul experienced in his ministry was a window, as it were, into the general pattern of the cross and the nature of God. So in other words, whenever Corinth looks at Paul, Paul's, Paul's not drawing attention to himself, unlike these super apostles. Paul's not drawing attention to himself. Whenever Corinth looks at Paul, they don't see Paul. They look through Paul, and they see Christ. Now, that's, that's the way that Christian ministry is supposed to work. Christian ministry doesn't draw attention to the self. Instead, it presents a window through which anybody who's looking is supposed to be able to see Christ, supposed to be able to see the cross, the nature of God. God is the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our afflictions. God shows that to Corinth through Paul. Paul suffered for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of the churches in Asia and in Achaia. And God comforts Paul in that affliction. And so those churches are able to see that in Paul. All of that is a preview of the resurrection, a window to, the, to view the resurrection, as it were. And ultimately, all of this is consummated in the ultimate 
interchange, the resurrection of the last day when Paul says that he and the brethren in Corinth will be able to boast of each other. On the day of our Lord Jesus, you will boast of us as we will boast of you. He's talking about marks of legitimacy. What makes Paul a real apostle? Well, the most concrete mark of Paul's authenticity as an apostle is the church that he started. Right? And of course, we don't take that in the wrong sense. Right? Christ is the founder of the church universal. But we mean the congregation in Corinth. Right? Paul acts as a father to them. And they are a mark of his, his apostolic authenticity. Right? And conversely, our, you know, our following the apostles is a mark of our legitimacy. Right? So in that way, we and the apostles are boasting in each other. And so that's going to set the tone for the entire epistle. Right, we're going to see the whole epistle dominated by these ideas, the theological ideas, that God is the God of all comfort, that God is the God who raises the dead, and that because of that, that binds us to each other, that binds us to the apostles in very specific ways. So those, those will be the major topics of the letter. Uh, the genuineness of Paul's um, apostolic ministry, the way that churches are to treat each other, particularly in contributing to the needy saints, as we'll see in uh, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. Um, all of these things center around this pattern of interchange that we've talked about uh, in God's nature as God of all comfort, Father of mercies, God who raises the dead. We want to thank you for joining us this week. We look forward to a profitable study in this epistle. And we want to close out, uh, as we almost always do, by inviting anybody who is watching this to turn to Christ. If you are not a Christian, we invite you to find a Church of Christ near you. If you're in the St. Petersburg, Florida area, get in contact with us, the 14th Avenue Church of Christ. Any church that you get in contact with is more than happy to study the way of the Lord Jesus with you. Study the way of the gospel. Um, again, like we've said over the course of this lesson, the gospel is a, a total way of living. It's not just a set of propositions that you accept as true. It's a mindset, a total set of behaviors that we engage in that are consistent with the thinking and the behavior of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, because that is pleasing to God. So we invite you, find a church near you, study those things, um, believe in the good news. That even though we have fallen short of those things, we've fallen short of the way of Jesus Christ, God sent his son to live as a man but to lead a sinless life, to give himself as a sacrifice for our sins so that we can be forgiven of our shortcomings. Believe in that good news. Turn away from the life of sin. Confess Jesus as Lord and be baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection for the remission of sins. And join us in awaiting that great day, the day of our Lord, uh, when we will all be raised in new life. Thank you for joining us this week. We look forward to seeing you next week. Until next time, take care. Bye-bye.